Good evening, everybody. My name is Matthew Geiger, and I'm joined by Andrew Zirkel. We are uh, the moderators of tonight's debate between all of the Libertarian vice chairman candidates. Um, the election is in July at the New Orleans 2018 National Convention, so if you are a delegate, make sure to go vote and be there. Uh, we're going to start off by uh, meeting each of tonight's candidates through a series of opening statements. Each candidate will have one minute to state their name, how long they've been a member of the Libertarian Party, and to give us a brief background of why they're running and why they should be elected vice chairman. So starting with Mr. Paschal, you have one minute. Hey, Joe Paschal here. Um, I've been a member of the Libertarian Party officially about a year, but the, um, I've been in the movement, so to speak, most of my life. Um, I want to be chair because I think we need to we need to get back to the roots of libertarianism and bring people in the party, expanding our footprint and building the party with liberty minded people. The rest, anybody else has anything they want to know about me, they're free to ask. I'm an open book. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pascal. Uh, moving on next to Mr. Hauptman. You have one minute. Okay. My name's Joe Hauptman. I'm the uh, one of the candidates, two candidates from Indiana. Um, I've been a member of the, the Libertarian Party since 1979. I've been active as a Libertarian since 1973 when I was a college student at Michigan State. I'm running because I think the LP is set for a period of rapid growth. And I know that our states are at varying levels of development. I've worked with parties uh, at all levels of development. I served as the state chair of Indiana in 1979, in 1998, and in 2015. So any state that wants my assistance can uh, You got about five seconds. On. Okay. That's Thank it. you, Mr. Hopman. Uh, moving on next to Mr. James Weeks. You have one minute. Well, let's see. Um, it depends on what level of membership, I guess, you count as joining the party. Uh, I joined my county libertarian party about 10 years ago now. Uh, it wasn't until... 2012, I believe it was, that I joined the uh, Michigan party. I don't think it was until like 2015 that I joined the national party. So I kind of kept moving. I stayed locally for my first time for, you know, a long time in there um, before moving up to the state party and trying to do anything there. Um, and uh, so it's been about if you count when I join, you know, it depends on where you count it. Do you count where I joined the national? Do you count when I joined the state? Or do you count when I joined my county? Uh, but I've been a libertarian my whole life. Um, been an anarchist since I was a teenager. Uh, my high school teachers, uh, my high school teachers, actually the one who informed me of that when we had a class project on designing a, a perfect government. And I was like, "Well, I don't want any government." She's like, "Well, you're an anarchist. You can't do anarchy on the class project." And I did it anyway. So. All right. All right. So our next opening statement is going to go to Mr. Sheets. First petition drive I participated in was 1994. I was the secretary of a county committee in 2004. Then uh, 2008, I became a county chair, uh, joined the state party 2010, then joined national in 2013, um, shortly before the national in 2014, like leading into that. Um, why I want to be vice chair. We need a clear, concise, consistent, professional message. I believe that people want libertarianism. I believe that people need libertarianism. And the way we do it is to have quality salesmanship of our message, because we have the best message of any party out there, period. All right, thank you. We're going to next move on to the opening statement for Mr. Vora. I've been a libertarian since I was a kid. I've been active in the party since 2010. I've run for office multiple times. I've been a representative at large in the LNC. And this is my second term as vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee. 
I'm running for a few specific purposes, but they all boil down to one principle, which is I want to majorly, massively cut the size, the scope, the authority, the respect, and the legitimacy of government. And I believe that we can do that. Our movement is large enough and it is growing enough to do that if we're bold enough to do it. And that means that the three types of libertarians, we need to work together. The first type is political libertarians. That's folks like us that work to change policy. The second type is techno libertarians. Those that use technologies like Bitcoin to help us circumvent the state. And the third type, which is the often overlooked individual choice libertarians, the breakaway success of the movement are people who voluntarily choose not to be part of government. Those are people about who, five seconds who voluntarily choose not to use, for example, government schools. I want to see these movements grow. And I think that the libertarian movement of the libertarian party is the way to make it happen. All right. Thank you. And we're next going to move on to the opening statement of Mr. Mercer. Go ahead. Hey, everybody. My name is Alex Merced, and I've been a libertarian since 2007, and I've been a libertarian party member since 2013 when I first ran for New York City public advocate, and since then have ran for U.S. Senate in 2016 and New York City comptroller in 2017. And I want to become vice chair because I want to push, um, I've always been pushing a message of positivity, of unity, of basically encouraging people to take back their rights because it's empowering, because it gives them an opportunity. But being vice chair, I want to focus on support and making sure that the LNC is always focusing on doing what's been doing and doing well, and that is providing state affiliates and candidates the support regarding ballot access, technological support, and media support. So that way, the focus can be on candidates and making sure that they are pushing the message and reaching a wider audience every day. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna be moving into our first series of questions. Um, we're breaking this debate into two separate rounds. Uh, in the first round, it's going to be Drew and myself asking each of the candidates questions. Um, and in the second round, it'll be questions um, from each of the candidates try to add another one of their um, opponents. So the first section of this round is gonna be um, an individual question posed to each of the candidates. They have a minute and a half to respond to the question that we're asking them, and other candidates may respond to the answer. Um, and, and without further ado, we're going to go ahead and ask the first question, and that's going to be for Mr. Joe Hoffman. Uh, Joe, the question is as follows. You've held positions in the Libertarian Party for roughly 40 years or so. Some say that it's time to step aside and allow those younger and newer than you to have their chance at advancing the party. What is your response to this, Mr. Hoffman? is that the younger people are absolutely essential to the party. Um, I'm glad to have reached an age now to be an elder statesman because, quite frankly, when we started the party, there were no elder statesmen. Um, we were it. Um, we've got a lot of experience that we can give you, um, but I don't think it is just time for us to leave. There's a lot of advice that we can give, and we're not a top-down organization. Quite frankly, it's more important to have the young people there running the local races where they can build a foundation as opposed to an old dog like me who, quite frankly, last time I ran, they'd go, oh, is Hauptman running again? Um, it's better for us to uh, do the background work and have the young people out front talking to the, people, talking to the uh, voters. All right. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have anything to add to this question? Mr. Moderator, I'd like to be recognized. All right. You are recognized. Go ahead. Uh, this is just follow, uh, following up on what Joe said. Uh, Joe, how do you feel that you would be uh, you know, a big part of the vice chair's job as a media representative doing outreach on national and international media? Do you feel that you are up to the task? I've spoken on C-SPAN before. I've spoken on television. I've spoken on radio. Um, I've done podcasts. I am not, I admit that compared to some of you, I am uh, charismatically challenged. I acknowledge that. But I've also spent uh, the last 23 years uh, talking in front of teenagers as a science teacher. I did six shows a day, 180 shows a year with an audience that couldn't leave. Um, I think I can handle it. All right. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have anything to add to this question before we move on? 
I'd like to respond. All right, go ahead. You're recognized. I, I really don't think it's fair to try and say that, you know, the old people who, not, I mean, not to <laughs> try and say that. I am but, old. Don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> uh, who, who, built, who built the party up uh, should go away or something like that. I mean, some of, some of the greatest friends that I've made are some of the people like, one of my greatest friends in the Libertarian Party of Michigan, uh, Dr. James Hudler. He was one of the founders of the Michigan Party, which the Michigan Party actually predates the National Party. And, uh, you know, he's, he's been around for a very, lo very long time, and I would hate to see someone like him be pushed aside. And I have seen, you know, people come in and try and push him aside, and I think it's completely unfair, um, you know, that, I mean, these are the people who were standing on their shoulders, all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Weeks. All right. So does anyone else have anything before we move on to the next question? All right. We're going to move on to the next question. And this one is for Mr. Pascal. So, Mr. Pascal, you are seen as a relative newcomer to the party. Um, we ask you, how can the delegates and the Libertarian Party entrust you with such an important and powerful position with little precedent for them to go off of? I mean, I would hope they would take my experience just managing people into effect. I mean, I've been all over the country, all over the world, had thousands of people working for me at any one time. Uh, I speak to people generally, I mean, at a very frank level, you know, open level. And, you know, the biggest thing is just being available and being approachable by people to let them know that, I'm here to answer any questions or just talk if they need to. All right. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have anything to add to this question before we move on? Okay. Um, seeing as no one wants to be recognized, we're going to move on to the third question of this section, um, and that is directed at Mr. Vora. Uh, so let's just address the elephant in the room. Uh, Mr. Vora, your statements have been no stranger to controversy and have sparked fierce debate about what the message of the Libertarian Party is. Do you truly believe that the statements you have made over the past year have con have contributed positively to the growth and development of the Libertarian Party? You have a minute and a half to respond. Absolutely. Uh, this debate is a perfect example. There were no vice chair debates the last time I was running, and there were no vice chair debates the time before that. And as far as I know, there was no vice chair debates the time before that either. Stirring controversy is a major part of any serious politics. You can look at, uh, at Hillary Clinton, you can look at Donald Trump, and you're gonna see that they're both very controversial figures, and that's inspiring, that's exciting. Specifically in the libertarian movement though, I do believe that our development, our strength as a party is going to come far more from the backbone of the individuals, which will inspire our true natural allies, rather than trying to pander to the dominant cultural models already sort of supported by the Democrats and Republicans. We are the only party that believes in the abolishment of government schools. We are the only party that believes in completely ending the drug war. That is supposed to trigger people because people disagree with that. If people are not disagreeing, I guarantee you this, if people, if you're communicating as a libertarian and people aren't disagreeing and they aren't pushing back, they didn't understand what you said. Either you weren't clear enough or you're too complex and logical or you did something that they couldn't understand. Our like party is inspiring and our party, our party's message is inspiring in its truest form. If you want to see the, got about biggest 10 success, seconds left. the biggest success of the libertarian movement right now is those who are opting out of government schools because they think it's a bad idea. It's not a policy change. It's a cultural change. And we okay. have to be willing to have that cultural war. All right. So, uh, someone oh, like to respond. All right. Is that you, Mr. Merced? Yes. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, while I understand the role of provocativeness, and I see how it's brought a lot of attention to the vice chair's race, and that's great, there's a debate. But the time that we're having this debate, this, the people watching this debate could be doing phone banking for Alison Foxhole or making donations and reaching out to people for Larry Sharp. It distracts from um, the front lines, the candidates, and, and it causes headaches for the affiliates. I mean, I'm not saying there's no role for controversy, but I'd rather people be focusing on state affiliates and candidates than what's going on in national leadership. Okay. Um, is there any other statements by any other candidates they'd like to make regarding this question? Yeah, I'd like to respond. All right. Go, Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, I know it's hard. Um, yeah, I would say that one of the problems we have is that 
everyone seems to think they have the best solution. And I believe the LP should be a marketplace of ideas. Um, controversy is fine, but we don't know what it takes to win because, quite frankly, we haven't done it. We've got, hopefully, 2,000 candidates running. Let us those who want to be radical be radical. Let those who want to be more moderate be more moderate. We'll have 2,000 examples to see what works best. All right. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have anything else to say before we move on? Well, no. if I could, Mr. Moderator. All right. Go um, ahead. You know, it, it, it's true. This has inspired a vice chair's debate, but it also has inspired a large number of libertarians leaving the party. So if we want to talk about what's positive, what's negative, I would suggest that, you know, it's important to have that simple, clear, concise, professional. It's professional. It's a big key factor, professional message, man. Because when we sit there and we just be provocative, then we chase some people away. People that we might be new to. About part. five seconds left. Done. Oh, all right. I'd Mr. Like to Beach, would you like to say something? Yeah, if, if we're if we're scared to say libertarian things out of fear that someone might run away, I mean, anytime someone says anything that's a libertarian on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you have a million people who probably aren't even members of the Libertarian Party. Let's be honest. Go, oh, I'm leaving. I'm not. This is why I'm not a part of the Libertarian Party. Blah blah blah. You know, so you have a million people that go out there every time. You could say something so basic as. We want to legalize marijuana. And you'd have people up in arms. I'm leaving the party. What kind of pot smoking hippie shit is this? You know, you have about five seconds left. We can't be afraid of saying stuff. We can't be afraid of saying libertarian stuff out of fear of losing non libertarians. All right. Um, does anyone have anything else to add before we move on? All right. Let's move on. Let's move on to our next question. Okay. So our next question is going to be for Mr. Merced. And. Um, similarly, similarly to Mr. Pascal, your experience in the um, Libertarian Party for leadership positions is relatively limited. So how can you translate your skill and experience as a candidate into the growth and development of the Libertarian Party? Okay, I've done uh, plenty of things other than just be a candidate. I've also been part of the uh, officers of the Manhattan and Brooklyn parties. I'm a director of policy in the Larry Sharp uh, for New York campaign. So I've been involved in the campaign uh, or involved in the Libertarian Party quite actively since I joined in 2013. I literally have a bag. Here's the stuff that I have next to my bed with marketing materials, brochures that I designed. Um, so that way, whenever anyone needs someone to petition, <laughs> I'm there. Um, so I've been on the ground as a candidate, as an officer, um, also just supporting other candidates. When people need stuff, they, re they reach out to me, whether it's media or just some advice, and it's giving me an idea of what people need to support. But I mean, I've also ran a retail store. So, and, I, when, when I, and that was when I was 20. People didn't think, oh, a 20 year old is just going to open up uh, a gaming retail store. So in the, my past, and when I was 22, I was training people at high levels of finance. So I've done things at much younger ages, and people always kind of doubted that I was going to be able to do at the time. Um, it's always been my strength and determination. And I, I owe a lot of that um, to my mother because, I mean, my mother, uh, an immigrant from Guatemala, raised two kids as a single mother working two jobs at the same time as going to school. And that really kind of informed my basically push to always go beyond what people expect of me. So if anyone's followed my history, they know that I always push hard. I always push harder. And I, 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 don't, I don't do anything to disappoint. Okay. Would uh, anybody like to respond to Mr. Merced's statements? Okay. Seeing as nobody wants to make a response, we're going to move on to our next question here. The fifth question of the section is for Mr. Sheets. Uh, many people have seen you as the quote-unquote vanilla candidate, uh, essentially continuing the status quo of the Libertarian Party. Mr. Sheets, what do you bring to the table that separates you from the other candidates in the field? During my tenure as uh, chairman of the Libertarian Party of Montgomery County, we went out and we we took on the government head to head in an eminent domain case. Um, we basically stopped the government from taking a little old lady's, her family's property. It was a storefront in Abington Township. And I regard that one as a win. But what I bring to the table is, again, simple. What I want to do, I want to bring people together. I want to make some things happen. Right now, we have been kind of fighting at each other. Right, we've been 
just nipping at each other's heels, trying to make something happen, but yet nothing's happening because we're just so busy beating each other over the head. What I want to do, I want to bring people together and I want to make something different happen for a change. I'd like to get a policy win for once. Just, just something simple to say that libertarians can do something, can come together, can work together, and can make something happen. That's what I believe. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to respond to that? I would Mr. like to respond. Moderator, I would. Okay. Um, we're going to go to Vora, yeah, and then we're going to go to Mr. Pascal. All righty. Uh, Steve, I certainly appreciate the excellent work you guys did in terms of the eminent domain case. Uh, have you often spoken either publicly or otherwise about some of the big issues? I mean, eminent domain is a drop in the bucket compared to things like the spending on government schools, compared to the huge spending on military overreach, the huge spending on other areas. Uh, do, you, do you often speak about some of those issues as well? Uh, yes, and I also speak about the injustice system. How many people in this world have been screwed over by our criminal injustice system in the United States? That's the one issue that I believe I can get Democrats, Republicans, Greens, even socialists and communists together on that same page with us working to promote freedom. All right. Um, Mr. Pascal, would you like to uh, contribute to this conversation? Yeah, so yeah. I, I, we talk about growing the party. We all talk about it in different ways, I guess. But And part of this is, you know, we need to, there's a lot of women involved in the movement and they don't they don't have as big a voice you know it, it becomes this party has become a lot of the people in the party let me say have become an ego measuring contest we need to the women have the biggest impact on our children in day-to-day -day lives so if we allow their voice to be heard it's going to feed down to our children and help our movement mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak before we move on to the next question? All right, Matt, I think you have the next question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Weeks, you're the last one uh, here. Your name has been forever associated with the infamous stripping incident at the 2016 Libertarian National Convention. In addition to this, you have stated on the Facebook page for your campaign that you will quote unquote, push the libertarian message so hard that the libertarian national committee will call for your resignation at least once a month during your tenure <laughs> <laughs> mr weeks how yeah. do you expect the aforementioned events and statements to further libertarianism and the party in this country you have a minute and a half to respond well i, I kind of see how uh milk toast the libertarian party has gotten to the point where saying libertarian stuff uh, gets people all riled up and going, oh, you can't say that. You can't say libertarian stuff, you know. So as, as you know, as vice chair, I'd go around and I'd say things like, you know, all cops are bastards, which is a statement of fact. Um, a very libertarian thing to say. It may be inflammatory and people may not like it. I'd like uh, to respond. But it's a uh, it's something that can be said that would probably call for my resignation or censure, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, police abuse of powers is a, is a huge libertarian issue. And um, if libertarians are unwilling to call things out, uh, like the murder of a thousand people a year by the uh, police in America, uh, you know, calling it out may, you know, the milk toast libertarians around here might call for my censure. So I'll push that message. I'll like push all the libertarian I like to respond. All right. I would also like to respond. We're going to, uh, all right. We're going to go to Mr. Merced first. Don't worry. Everyone's going to get an opportunity to respond. Mr. Merced, you have 30 seconds. Bottom line, it's not about saying libertarian things. It's about who, basically, in this case, you have a national leader distracting from candidates and state officers. People should say libertarian things. I say very libertarian things all the time. I talk about ending the drug war, ending wars across the country. Um, but it matters. It's not just what you say, it's how you say them, especially if you're representing everybody. Because if you're the national vice chair, you're in the national leadership, you represent moderates, you represent radicals, you represent anarchists, minarchists, uh, left libertarians, right libertarians, you represent everybody. And you have to be cognizant of that. If you want to just say what you want to say, then do yeah, be a candidate. Be um, a state, uh, be a chair of a local affiliate. Get involved somewhere else. But national represents everybody. All right. Um, I saw Mr. Vora. Did you want to say something about this? 
I did. Um, right. And and I know that people are going to say that Mr. Weeks' idea of, of pushing against the police is a fool's errand. You're never going to get people to not join the police, but that's wrong. Messages like that are actually working. They're actually getting fewer and fewer people to join the police. Major cities are seeing a shortage in recruitment. Now, imagine if we took that to the next level. Imagine if People said, I will not join the police until you end the drug war. Imagine if we just held the police hostage and said, you won't get this. So I'm going to say that that while you know my messaging, while radicals may be softer than Mr. Weeks, I understand where he's going. And that kind of cultural libertarianism is working right now in America. All right. Um, I saw Mr. Hopman also wanted to respond to this. Do you still want to respond? Yes, I do. All right. You have um, about 30 seconds. This approach is not new. Uh, back in the late 90s, uh, Michael Cloud wrote an article about the great libertarian macho flash. Uh, by the way, first off, am I allowed to use any of those words you're not allowed to say on the radio on this show? Yes, you may. All right. Uh, as Michael Cloud said back in the uh, late 80s, um, you're at a, a, a cocktail party and a little old lady walks up to you, a little grandma, and says, oh, you're a libertarian. What's that stand for? And you turn to her and you smile and you say, fuck the state. Okay, well, you're right. Okay, it's true. You can feel morally superior. You summed it up simply. And you've made sure that there's at least one person who will never vote for a libertarian. Yes, we have to attack the police abuse. We have to attack the thousand people killed. But that's different from saying that all police are bastards. All right, Mr. Sheets, I saw you wanted to say something. Yes. All right. You have about okay. 30 seconds. Got it. We have elected libertarians in Montgomery County. In that, in that election process, we actually made sure that no Republicans won in, that, in this particular last election cycle. We did that by knocking on house doors. We did that by working the polls and explaining the abuses. But we did it in a professional manner. And the only way you get the people to actually pull the lever for libertarian is to be professional. If you act like an asshole, then the people will view you as an asshole, period. That's it. Mr. Moderator. Did we just lose audio? Oh, sorry. Yeah, we were, sorry. Our mic was muted. Yeah, Mr. Pascal, would you like to go? Yes, very quickly here. We are we're very good at identifying problems in this in the Libertarian Party. But the whole thing is we need to start identifying solutions to these problems. Just complaining about it, just bitching about it day in and day out doesn't do anything and it doesn't help our movement. What we have to come up with is, hey, this is a problem. We all know it's a problem. But here's our solution to this problem. Let's stop bitching about the problem and work on fixing the sol and coming up with solutions to fix the problem. Here, here. May I respond? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Weeks. I think that we have bigger issues. People like to say that it's that people are against libertarian macho flash or whatever. People say that. Um, you know, that's what keeps us from winning elections is people saying stuff like fuck the state or all cops are bastards. That's not what keeps us from winning elections. That's not what keeps people from supporting us. What keeps people from winning elections and keep people from supporting us is that the Libertarian Party has become a safe haven for alt-right types, for neo-Nazis that have come in here into the Libertarian movement, hijacked the brand and have gone around telling everybody that they're they're libertarians that they're the true libertarians that the seconds. hoppian message is true libertarians that all that people like me are just commies who need to be thrown from helicopters and i've seen that on your page okay. um that's the real problem that's why we're not getting anywhere all right um okay so we're gonna go ahead and segue into the next question here uh that, that wraps up our first section which is uh individual questions for candidates we're moving into the second section of the first round. Uh, this section is going to be a series of general questions. I'll be asking a single question as well as Drew, uh, and every single candidate will answer this question. Uh, each candidate will, will give uh, will be allowed one minute to respond to the question, um, and then afterwards we'll allow candidates to address other candidates' uh, responses individually. So uh, the first question of this round uh, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Hotman. We have an order here. You'll be addressed when it's your time to speak. Uh, the first person who will be asked, who will be answering the question, is Joe Hotman. 
Um, and that is, is there anything you would change about the Libertarian Party platform? If so, what would it be and why? At this point, uh, the document changes every time around. Uh, for instance, we do not have a platform on abortion because we know that there are people who have libertarian positions on both sides. So we are absolutely quiet on it. And as a result, we have had pro-life candidates running on the same ticket as pro-choice candidates. Uh, I would not, if we could be absolutely quiet on it and not come across either pro-choice or pro-life, I would support that. I would not support removing our current plank and then substituting with stuff that makes us look like we are pro-life. Okay, uh, moving on. The next person to answer this question is Mr. Pascal. You have one minute. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question because I've been tossing it around lately. Anyway, I mean, I think we need to at least address before, the, before it gets out of hand. If you really want to trigger a group of libertarians, mention vaccines on a web page or something. And there's so many different it's almost just like the abortion issue right i mean it, it, we are well divided on mandatory vaccines i think it's something and it's high time the party did address it one way or the other okay um moving on uh mr weeks you have one minute uh one thing to change about the platform uh go back to the the pre-portland massacre platform that'd be cool um I don't know. There's the pre Portland ma massacre platform was pretty good. Uh, right now, you know, I don't really have any problems with the platform too much. Um, there are some issues that definitely need to be strengthened. Um, I think that uh, it needs to respect the Dallas Accord a little bit more. Um, but all in all, it's a pretty good platform. Um, I, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of a single plank that I'm like, oh, I hate that plank. I want to get rid of it. You know, I know there are libertarians out there who can't stand some of the planks, but you know, I, you know, they're, 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 they all look good to me. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. The next candidate to answer this question is Mr. Sheets. Go ahead. Being a member of the platform committee, um, open to any suggestions by anybody here who wants to make changes to the platform. But um, be that as it may, my own personal feeling is that the only changes I would make would be to clean up the language, adjust for punctuation, any kind of grammar mistakes that have been made previously. I don't want to mess with anything, least of all the abortion plank. I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole for the same reasons that were very well articulated previously. Um, there are a lot of libertarians, both pro-life and pro-choice, and... It's not our business, period. Okay. Uh, next is Mr. Vora. You have one minute to respond. Our platform right now often tries to be technically libertarian correct in a way that we are guaranteeing that no one's going to really understand what we're saying. I would start with the education and military planks. I would change the educational plank to say something like the Libertarian Party supports the immediately immediate end of all government schools, charter schools, and vouchers. No one but parents or guardians has any financial responsibility. Something like that where it's very clear and it's going to be more incendiary than the abortion plank, but libertarians will be on one side and everyone else will be on the other side, as it should be. I would do something similar with the military plank. I would say the Libertarian Party supports immediately leaving NATO and all other untangling alliances rather than just saying things like entangling alliance in the abstract. Our platform should be big. It should be bold. It should be blunt. It should be incendiary as hell so that people debate us on real libertarian issues so that those issues are so big that no one even bothers about, about, 10 about abortions okay thank you uh next is mr merced you have a minute to respond i agree with steve sheets honestly other than grammatical and, and sentence structure kind of issues honestly nothing i the way it is now is actually pretty good because honestly it's supposed to be a canvas the platform's supposed to be a canvas that the candidates are supposed to go out there and educate if the if basically you leave if the platform does everything, then there's no role for the candidate to educate and articulate and develop the communication that's needed to reach out to people and build the bridges that we need to make. So to me, I want the candidates really filling in the details. I want the platform just kind of giving structure by which candidates can go forward. 
Okay, uh, now is the chance to enter into debate. If anybody has um, something they would like to address about another candidate's response... I, I would like to address something. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, th go ahead, Mr. Bauer. You, you, have, have, you have 30 seconds. Exactly. Uh, what Alex Merced has just said, in my opinion, is respectfully absolutely false. Right now, we have many candidates that are going around not educating, but just telling flat-out falsities about the libertarian message. Min neither minarchism nor anarchism allows any government schooling of any kind. And the fact that we have candidates that are going on saying that shows us how badly our platform needs to be clearer, bolder, and unarguably libertarian. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Velrod. Does anyone else have anything before we move on to the next general question? I'd like to take a two-minute break. Um, we're, we're planning on taking a five-minute intermission pretty soon. Um, okay. But yeah, who, who else wanted to say something? I'd like to say something. All right, Mr. Weeks, go ahead. You have 30 I just, I just remembered, so I wanted to circle back a little bit and to add on to what Arvin said. Um, uh, one, one plank that's really not worded well at all is the immigration plank to the point where you have people that think that libertarians support closed borders. When we've always been an open borders party, it has always been an open borders platform, but the current, the way it's currently written uh, and the way it kind of got chopped down um uh, in recent years to the point where you have people that think that the, the libertarian party platform supports complete closed borders. And you have about five seconds. No, it doesn't. Libertarianism is for open borders. All right. So does anyone else have anything before we move on to our next general question? All right. This is going to be our last question before we move on to our five minute break. All right. So this one is um, for everyone. Again, it's a general question. It is what would you do? as vice chair to extend the organizational and fundraising capabilities of the party to the local and state level. And we're going to go in reverse order this time. So we're starting with Mr. Marcel. You're still on mute, Mr. Marcel. There we go. Um, yes. Um, but basically what I'd be doing is what I do now is just basically trying to give people tools, whether it's through uh, helping people through graphic design, helping people through uh, messaging, helping people through just being a good face. But far as when it comes to fundraising goes, I'm more than glad to cast a sh to be always constantly making the focus, the highlighting candidates, as I already do with, with my podcast. I have candidates on there so that way people know who the candidates are and always encouraging them to donate. And on that note, I encourage everyone who's watching right now to go donate and phone bank for Allison Foxhole's campaign. Go donate and volunteer for Larry Sharp's campaign. It's bottom line is the job of national leadership when they get the national spotlight to always be casting the, the spotlight on the candidates who are running now. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to Mr. Vora. Mr. Vora, what do you have to say in response to this question? We need to reach out to our natural allies, and we need to do that through our bold messaging. Why do so many homeschoolers vote Republican? Because they don't even know the libertarian message on government schooling. When they do, that changes the way they look at the party. And this is a big and powerful group, many times the size of the libertarian party. If we want people to support us, if we want people to fight for us, we need to fight for them first. And I believe that the way that we do that is to fight for the, fight the cultural wars that make it clear which side we're on in these issues. That means reaching out to entrepreneurs rather than government workers. It means reaching out to, to homeschoolers rather than public school teachers. It means reaching out to people who are not part of the state rather than starting with people who are part of the state. And so that's what I would do. I would do everything I could to reach out to our natural allies and encourage them to be part of our movement by fighting for them first. All right, Mr. Sheets, you're next up to respond to this question. Yeah. Our natural allies are everybody. Um, whether you are on the left or you are on the right, there are things that people will agree with libertarians on. When I talk to people on the left, I say, hey, we have a lot of common ground, man. We have, we're both anti-war. We're both basically trying to do what's best for our kids. We want better education. And better education doesn't necessarily have to say, um, we want to end this right this second without having some positive, legitimate solution in place. And it's the same goes for everything else. When it comes time to talk to Republicans and conservatives, we talk to them about fiscal responsibility. My God, how many, how many Republicans and how many conservatives are really upset with the Republican Party because the Republican Party is no longer fiscally conservative? Um, everybody's sick and tired of the endless wars of aggression. It doesn't matter what side you are on. 
The only people who aren't are the people who are just not really quite understanding what it's all about. So that's where I'm going for it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheets. Um, we're going to move on to Mr. Weeks. What do you have to say in response to this question? Can you repeat yeah. the question? Oh, all right. Um, so we're asking, what would you do as vice chair to extend the organizational and funding capabilities of the party at both the local and state level? Well, definitely recruiting people who have a similar message, similar you know goal uh, to us. And by that, I mean we need to encourage all libertarians to join the Libertarian Party. Um, in, in recent years, I've seen some movement within the party to try and reach out to you know a unite the right kind of message, uh, allying with the authoritarian right. That's, that's the wrong strategy. We need to uh, bring in the libertarian left because they're libertarians. You know, no authoritarian should be welcome in the libertarian party. They're our enemy. I don't care if you want to say that uh, <laughs> they're our allies and we have some common ground with them, but we really don't. Our common ground with people is that we're libertarians, that we want the opposite of authoritarianism. You know, you could make an argument for just about anyone, and I've seen it done. You have about 10 seconds. I've seen it done where people have tried to find libertarian common ground with uh, Pinochet, a brutal military dictator in, in Chile. And uh, who cares if there's even one thing we agree on? We should Let's wrap it up with people like Pinochet or his supporters. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Weeks. We're going to move on to Mr. Hopman. You have 60 seconds to respond to the question. Okay. What I would do is work with the National Party to try to get a database that is actually usable by the states. Having been a state chair, that has been a complaint constant. Uh, and I think we have to look beyond membership. Membership is the highest level of commitment. But the problem is the lower, part, the lower organizations don't have the resources to sort through all of the chaff to find the people that are our natural allies. I would like to see a national database where if a candidate in Pennsylvania says, I've got an area that is really into uh, homeschooling, who's into homeschooling, national can spit them a list of people that that's their issue. If someone in Illinois says it is time for us to move for recreational marijuana, who is that the issue for? National can spit them a list. It's going for the low-hanging fruit, and I think the job of national is to bend some of those branches down so that the local parties can reach that fruit. So that's what I would put my emphasis on. So, Mr. Pascal. <laughs> Oh, oh, was I muted? Yeah, you're muted. All right, we're going to move on to Mr. Pascal now. Mr. Pascal, you have 60 seconds to respond to this question. Right. Thank you. Um, I, it's in my platform, I mean, on my web page and everything. I've talked about this for quite some time, to, to use the position as vice chair to work with some of the big no donors in the party and create a pack for local candidates to use. That's the biggest problem. And unlike a lot of people, I do feel that the, the first national elected libertarian is probably going to come from a Western state, you know, be it from New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, or something. They have the most libertarian ideals in general. I mean, you look at New Mexico, really big following for Gary Johnson. I mean, Montana, you know, libertarianism in nature, you know, I think the political action committee for local candidates is going to help our movement more than anything because these candidates can't get their voice out if they don't have money for commercials, airtime, and everything else. All righty. Thank you so much. Now we move into the debate part of this question. Um, once again, if you would like to respond to one of the answers of a particular candidate, mm -hmm. You may do so now. Mr. Merced, sure. you were recognized. You have 30 seconds to be recognized. Yeah. Yep. Um, basically, I 100% agree with uh, what Joe Hoppen was saying regarding uh, da databases and downloads. Technological support is a very 
big way the LNC can help. And there, I think some the, the, the candidate support committee is working on a data management project that people can donate to now if they want to. So I encourage people to reach out to the candidate support committee, learn about that project and support that because that, it's, that's, that is very important. So Joe hit that on the head. So I just wanted to point that, say that. All right, uh, Mr. Vora, you wanted to be recognized. You have 30 seconds. I would like to respond to Mr. Sheets. Uh, what we have here is a candidate for vice chair of the Libertarian Party who in one sentence both said that government schools are a legitimate solution, implied that, and that homeschooling is an illegitimate solution. That's exactly backwards. Government schooling is not a morally legitimate solution to educational needs at all. It is funded through, through taxation. I'm not even going to include the fact that it's just straight bad. And suggesting that homeschooling is not a legitimate solution to the educational needs of the country right now is anti-libertarian and completely out of touch with our natural allies. Okay, since Mr. Sheets was, was uh, yeah, Mr. No. We'll recognize you in a moment, but since Mr. Sheets was directly mentioned in Mr. Vora's statement, Mr. Sheets has the opportunity to respond for thirty seconds. Yeah, that's not that's not exactly what I said. What I said is we can't end public schools right this second, today, right now. Um, not even homeschoolers will tell you that we can take on the burden of every single child being homeschooled right this second. You know that, and, it, and frankly, it's disingenuous to say otherwise. Um, right now, what we need to do is we need to focus on something that's better, something that's like stronger. If you wanna work on homeschools, that's great, but we need to have something that is better. You know, 10 seconds left. Yeah, that's better than our state-run schools. Until we have something that's better than our state-run schools, we can't eliminate them. Okay, uh, Mr. Hopman, you wanted to be recognized. You have 30 seconds. Yeah, again, this is an old debate that goes back from the beginning. Um, the position taken by our current uh, vice chair is what I've often called a uh, Star Trek libertarian. He believes we can get from here to there by beaming there. Okay, and not having to pass through the mid messy middle stuff in between. Like it or not, we live in a democracy. Okay, and if you start talking to people about the end product with no I example of how you're going to get there, all that happens is their eyes will glaze Mr. over. I'd like to speak real quick. Mr. Moderator, do I get a right okay, of applause? Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. So there are multiple people that want to say something. What's going to happen is... Um, since Mr. Bowers was, was directly called out, he has the opportunity to respond. However, I believe we had Mr. Weeks and Mr. Pascal that both wanted to say something. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what's going to happen is Mr. Vora, you're going to be recognized for 30 seconds. Um, and unless Mr. Vora directly calls somebody else out, it's going to go Mr. Weeks and then Mr. Pascal. All right. So Mr. Vora, you have 30 seconds to respond. We live in a time of Star Trek. We live in a place with free online education. We live in a, in a time when there's huge homeschooling support. If this is not a time when the vice chair of the Libertarian Party can say we are ready to cut government schools and end them right now, if we can't have a vice chair that will stand up for basic common sense when it is literally free online, we are not a Libertarian Party. We are just a status party. I will be a vice chair that will stand against government schools and, all, and against any kind of nonsensical excuse, including ones that may come from inside the party. Okay, uh, Mr. Weeks, you have 30 seconds to make your statements. Yeah, if, if we only limit uh, what we say to things that are possible in the next week or maybe the next two weeks or the next month, um, and that's the only thing we talk about with people is things that are completely easily accomplishable in, in a short period of time, it loses the message of libertarianism because libertarianism is radical change. We are radical change. And to bring up, you know, Donald Trump, now terrible guy, but he ran on a campaign going chanting, build the wall, build the wall, you know, and all these people were chanting with him, build the wall, build the wall. There was no plan. It, it's not happening. It's never going to happen. But that was a campaign. Left. You know, that was his campaign is that if libertarians can't just say libertarian stuff and run on that campaign, what, what can we do? Even if it's not accomplishable right, in, in the elected term. Okay. Um, Mr. Pascal, you have 30 seconds to respond. First, I want to say I do agree with the homeschooling because we homeschool our children. Second thing I'd like to say is we do not live in a democracy. Democracy is mob rule. We live in a constitutional republic. <sighs> Can I respond? Oh, yep. Oh, I wanted to respond to James. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. 
who who asked to be recognized? James did first. James, okay, James. And then, then I did second. Okay, James, James, Mr. Merced. Yeah, a, uh, a, a constitutional republic is just a representative democracy limited in power by a constitution. North Korea is also a constitutional republic, as was the USSR. In fact, the USSR's constitution was was mirrored after the United States Constitution. Um, so <laughs> saying that we're not a democracy, we're a, a constitutional republic is is meaningless it, it doesn't it's that it, it, it's nothing all right thank you mr weeks we're going to go to mr merced and then we're going to wrap it and go into intermission okay yeah the only thing i wanted to say is that um it's not it's not a binary in the sense that it's either say only the most radical libertarian position or the other choice is say what's only practical in the next week or two there's there's a grand uh, canyon in between. You should say libertarian propositions, bold libertarian propositions, that we would like to have a world where basically private education options are able to take be the whole market. But in the meantime, we need to focus a, a light on things like Thales Academy, that is a private solution that is expanding those options, but realize those options yeah, aren't going to be second. available 100% overnight to get people to do that buy-in. So we, you have to sew the needle both ways when you're communicating. It's it's a mix of both, of hot and cold. So it's not all one, it's not all the other. And, uh, and then trying to frame it that way is disingenuous. All can right. I, can I respond? We're, we need to wrap it up and go to intermission. We'll have plenty of questions afterwards, and we'll let the candidates directly address each other. So we're going to be gone for about five minutes, so I ask all the candidates to stay here. I ask all the viewers to stay here because we'll be back soon. And make sure you share this video because we need to get this information out there. So people can be informed. Okay, and just for our candidates that are still here, um, you guys are still alive, so just don't say anything that might incriminate you. <laughs> <laughs> so is it is it still up or something? They can hear us. Yeah, yeah, no, everything yeah, is going to be live. You can mute yourself during this intermission if you want to go grab a drink or go to the bathroom, but we we have everything still up. I had to go to the bathroom. Sorry, guys. So, Steve, I am. I, I would like to talk to you a little jo bit. Sometime Joe, because... Joe, Joe, you're, we're we're still alive, man. I, you get, yeah. Okay. Joe, you're more than welcome. <laughs> I'm just letting you know before you say anything. That's fine. Yeah, we got it. No, I, I knew. It's just you know, we're people too, right? We're not just candidates. We're we're people. <laughs> Arvid's talking, I can't hear a word he's saying. Arvin, you must Arvin. have really you're you're talking, man. Nobody can hear what you're yeah, saying. You're, you're muted. <laughs> He must be on a stream. He might be on a stream. Oh. Yeah, he, he's probably on a stream. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened exactly.
We are currently in intermission. I am fading fast. All right, if you just said something really, really important, you were muted for that entire time. No, <laughs> no I, mean, I know. We, you're, you're, we know you were yeah. on a live stream. <laughs> All right, we're gonna yeah, we're we're gonna go again, get started right back up again. Um, yep. we're we're gonna we're gonna get get rolling again with another question in about two minutes. We just need to wait for everyone to be be ready and unmute themselves. So, when everyone's ready and back in, just let us know. I'm in. All righty. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, in. I'm ready. Okay. All right. So All right. let's turn our camera back on. Okay. Okay. We so. Back. All right. So we're gonna continue with the exact same section we were at. Um, for those of you that are just joining us now, um, we're asking the candidates general questions. Each candidate has a minute to respond to that question, and then we enter into um a series of responses by each candidate. So this is the last qu question in that section and it goes as follows. We're going to start with uh Mr. Hotman uh and the question is the Libertarian Party has statistically seen more success in western states. Should the Libertarian Party relocate its headquarters out west and take a western states only approach? You have one minute to respond. I would not Me? at this point support moving the uh, office uh, at one time our office was in texas it at that time was decided that that since it is centered in washington that is where the headquarters could be i would say that the fact that we're holding this debate online none of us being in even the same state indicates that we can have a western strategy without a physical location in the Western states. Yes, I believe we should have a Western strategy or a Midwest strategy. Uh, Indiana pulled 4.99% for uh, Governor Johnson, uh, one one hundredth below Maine, and the second highest this side of the Mississippi. Um, there is a lot of support for the libertarian ideas in yeah, the middle of the left. country. But I don't see any reason to physically move the office at this time. All right. Mr. Pascal, you have one minute. Um, actually, I don't think it's, we should move the office, no. But I do believe that we should really look into, instead of having one vice president, I really think, or vice chair, sorry, vice chair, to having vice chairs for each district in the country. Sorry, guys, for having vice chairs for each district so they can kind of tailor fit needs for each district in the country. Is my, but no, I don't think we need to move the, the headquarters. Okay, uh, moving on, Mr. Weeks, you have one minute to respond. No, it, it doesn't really matter where the headquarters is at. You know, we live in in an age where everything's pretty much got everything done online you can do you know we're doing this all online um you don't <laughs> we don't need to move the headquarters uh <laughs> right you know the the government you know is is over on the uh coast there that's where most of the you know the federal stuff goes where we need people to be there um to fight but you know uh I, I don't necessarily disagree with, you know, focusing on states or areas that we do really well on with candidates and focusing a lot of, you know, resources there. But, you know, it really doesn't matter. We're still in a in the, the point in, our, you know, the libertarian history that we're still needing to educate people on what a libertarian is. So having... Um, you know, diverting yeah, resources that. away from some areas may not be the best strategy at all because there's still people that need to learn what a libertarianism, what libertarianism is all across the country. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next candidate to respond will be Mr. Sheets. You have one minute. Um, how can you disagree with 
with what these guys are saying. We do need to focus on our messaging. We need to focus on our candidates. We don't need to move anything anywhere. There's there's these things called planes. We can go places. We can be places in a matter of hours and be on the ground in front of people, face-to-face, -face, talking, working, educating. This is what we need to be spending our money on, walking, talking, educating, clear, concise professionalism. That's it. Okay, next is Mr. Vora. You have one minute. I think that idea is completely insane. Uh, you won't find a bigger supporter of doing things, everything online than me. I run my whole business online as much as I can. But the fact is being in DC or being in New York gives us a huge advantage. Uh, during the 2016, during inauguration day on 2016, I was able to attend so many events in DC representing the Libertarian Party because I was in DC. And the other staff that was in DC, they were doing the same thing. At one point, there was a there was a commercial break for one event that I was at. I ran quickly across you know a few blocks to a different event. That is possible because of the location, you know, being in, in location. Same applies in New York, and same applies to other places. That's it, it wouldn't make any sense to try to do that on the West Coast un unless you're thinking maybe Los Angeles or something like that that might have something similar. I would say that keep the office where it is. That's where the donors are who, who donated to it supported it. <laughs> and let's focus on making sure the whole country understands where we stand on things like ending That's government school, nice. ending the drug war, and bringing our troops home. Okay. Uh, next, we have Mr. Merced. You have one minute. Okay. Um, bottom line, I, I agree with everybody else. I don't see any particular reason to move it. I do think there is a lot of value in having uh, a presence in all the major cities. Um, so like uh, Arvin said, he's over there in Washington, D.C. I'm in, I'm in New York City. I think there's a value in, in developing the presence there, but that doesn't necessarily need mean another and another office or moving our existing office. I think the status, the status quo, at least regarding the office, is fine. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Merced. Um, would anyone else like to comment on this issue before we move on to the next question? All right. We're ready to move on to a new section. And this section is going to be similar to the general question section. Um, we're going to give a question, and it is going to be a question from someone else, someone inside the Libertarian Party, but not from us. And each one of you will have 60 seconds to respond. But as, as we don't have a, a super long amount of time left, um, we're going to have everyone respond once and we're going to move on to the next question. So this first one comes from Nicholas Sarwak, who is the chairman of the Libertarian Party. And he made this question for you guys. He asks, what specific, what specific skill do you bring to the position that is different from all of the other candidates? So we're going to go reverse order this time. We're going to start with Mr. Merced. Okay. Um, I have a, a one. Uh, basically, I do share a lot. I think I share a lot, a lot of skills with Arvin Fares, mm -hmm. um, communication skills, mm -hmm. uh, working as an educator, um, which I also share with Joe, uh, who also works as an educator. Um, but I also, I'm, I'm very tech savvy. Um, I'm very good with media production, whatnot. And um, also, I, I feel like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm good at um, being sort of the neutral observer when people are having um, disagreements. And, and that's one of the things I want to do as vice chair, is be a mediator for um, as, as, as different groups try to work together in the party. Because a lot of times we, we get lost, we get distracted by some of the uh, uh, disagreements or uh, arguments within the factions. I want to help mend that and just be a unifying figure in moving forward with work. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Merced. We're going to move on to Mr. Vora. What specific skill do you bring to this position that's different? We have 60 seconds for you to respond. The largest controversy that I've been a part of in the Libertarian Party hasn't been any of the things that go on in internal politics. It's been national stuff. Probably the biggest one was when an, a line from one of my interviews was quoted by WikiLeaks. They thought it was cool. A lot of other people strongly disagreed with it. In order for somebody to be an effective communicator at the national level, they need to be unafraid to be bold. They need to know how to stir things up. They need to know how to pro provoke a reaction. The particular line that I used at the time was something that I had intentionally practiced, predicting correctly in that case, that it would create a large and explosive reaction. And that's a way that we get the libertarian message out. You know, that was broadcast to all of the WikiLeaks followers talking about thousands and thousands of people. When I've been interviewed on places like RT or MSNBC, it's the same thing. My positions are bold, they are clear, they get spread around because they're exciting. I am not gonna be the flattest or safest or most neutral candidate, but I do believe that when it comes to media, I will be the most exciting one and be the best one for our long-term and serious outreach. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Mora. We're gonna move on to Mr. Sheets. You have 60 seconds to respond to the question. I brought people together. I brought libertarians, I brought Greens, I brought Republicans, brought Democrats, brought communists, socialists, leftists, rightists, everybody. And you know what we did? We went, we protested the drone base in Willow Grove. I got those people together and on board with that one simple issue. What I wanna do, I wanna bring that same group together to tack to tackle the injustice system. That's what I bring to the table. I've run meetings before as state chair. I can take over these meetings. And that's something I share in common with Arvind Vora. And um, that's pretty much it, brother. All right. Uh, next we'll have Mr. Weeks. You have one minute to respond or to make your statement. Well, I think... Uh... A big thing that I bring to the table is, is an ability to reach out to untapped demographics uh, like left libertarians. Also, I believe I bring to the table a um, the ability to smash the myth that we're just right-wing republican light party. Another thing that I'm pretty decent at is getting attention. I know how to get media attention. I don't think any libertarians got more media attention than me. So that, that's something I bring to the table. I bring to the table the ability to recruit and bring in new people that would have had nothing to do with the party. And I've been bringing them in already, you know, so it's happening. The Audacious Caucus is growing every day. We're getting new members all the time. There's new there's other new caucuses that I'm helping form that I may not necessarily agree with everything, but I'm helping them grow. I'm helping bring in left libertarians into the party. Uh have a libertarian unity we're going to have the entire bottom of the political uh quadrant we're gonna have libertarian unity that'll see our numbers grow drastically all right moving on next to mr hopman you have one minute well actually i'm finding myself uh lex's response i think the caucuses are important um thanks <laughs> among the other candidates um Many are excellent speakers. Uh, I think what I bring that is unique is an experience of working with parties at different stages of their growth. I've helped start a party when its uh, member uh, treasury was in a shoebox. I helped a party when it got our first office, when we got our first paid staff, uh, when we got ballot status. I've had personal experiences at all the different levels of growth, and I will make that available as vice chair to any of the states that uh, on the LNC, I will be a voice of uh, militant moderation. Uh, I believe my goal will to be to help people as an educator, I've had to do this, to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. All right. Thank you so much. Moving on to Mr. Pascal, you have one minute. Okay. Um, you know, the, we hear a lot in the party people talking about anarchists and homeschoolers and all this, but, you, you know, I can bring together a new demographic, demographic as well. I don't know if a lot of people have any idea how many off-gridders are libertarians. Yeah. Uh, there is such a big movement in the off gridders. I'll say and if this if Alex were saying the first opportunity to ask a question. Okay. I guess it, uh, am I on or I don't know if somebody would Yeah, yeah you're, you're on. on. We can hear yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, the doll you know, there's a big community of off gridders. There's Hutterite colonies, Mennonite colonies. All these people are actually registered voters, and they are part, they can really be big pieces of our movement, but nobody reaches out to them. These are the things we need to reach out to. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move into the final question. We, Like I said, because of time constraints, we can only get to two questions um, in this section. So the next question is going to be from uh, Larry Sharp. Larry Sharp asks, and by the way, the first person who's going to be answering this question is, um, since we're going in a serpentine order, it's going to be you, Mr. Hopman. Um, it's going to be, uh, or, the, or the question from Larry Sharp is, uh, what would have to be true in 2020 for you to know that you have been successful as Vice Chairman of the Libertarian National Committee? 
You guys have all 60 seconds to respond, starting with you, Mr. Hotman. I'm afraid I didn't quite get the question. Could you give it to me again, please? Yeah, I got you. What would have to be true in 2020 for you to know that you were successful? 2020 ah, up. Yep. What would be successful? What would be successful is that the National Party has grown to a place where it can provide resources to local campaigns that allow them to be competitive. I think that our major problem is that I'm each trying to enforce our own view of what successful. I think our job, since we really are only called to run a convention and nominate a presidential candidate, is to build the resources for the lower parties, down ticket parties to um, grow. I also would like to see the LNC put forth convention a draft agreement between the presidential candidate and the LNC as to the sharing of data. This has been about 10 an issue left. every single time. You know, time. five seconds left. Uh, oh, that's it? Okay. Yielded. All right. <clears throat> Uh, the next person to respond would be you, Mr. Pascal. You have one minute to respond. I would measure my success in why, um, how many more states had ballot access, you know, full-time ballot access. That's something we really need to work on. And by standing up our local affiliates, that happens. I am fortunate enough to live in Montana where we have 100% ballot access. We need, every okay. year, we need to grow that by 10% of the state. Every year. That's what I would feel it to be success. Okay. Uh, next is you, Mr. Weeks. You have one minute to respond. Okay. Well, there's there's a few things that I would uh, like to accomplish in uh, two years as vice chair. One, I'd like the uh, the phrase, oh, you guys are just Republicans who smoke pot to be dead and buried. I would like to never hear that again. Um, I think that it would be a great idea. I would really feel accomplished if we were able to establish an Austin Accord to reaffirm the Dallas Accord. That would be a great success. I would like to uh, see all this, let's purge the anarchist shit stop. I would like to see that stop. I would like to see us be able to come and work together as libertarians and... Uh, <laughs> and really work to bring a world set free in our lifetime. We have a long way to go. We don't have time for, you know, all this fighting over what, whether we're left libertarians, right libertarians, what kind of economic systems we want in the end. We're so far away from where we need to go. We are so far away that all this petty fighting needs to stop. So I would really feel accomplished. If we were able to uh, reaffirm the Dallas Accord with an Austin Accord. Stop the purging anarchist stuff, and also stop this Republican. You know, we're just Republicans who smoke pot stuff. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Weeks. We're going to move on to Mr. Sheets. How would you say that you were successful if in 2020? What would make you say you were successful in 2020? I agree with Mr. Weeks. We need to stop the infighting. But more importantly, I want to have a clear, concise, simple professional message. In addition to that, I want to have a really strong inroads to a free market solution to our injustice system, because we can have that. And the way we do that is by working together with people. We, the people of the United States, that's the only way we get things done, is if we, the people, make it happen. And I believe that we can do that. And going into 2020, that's what I'm going for. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to Mr. Vora. You have 60 seconds to answer the question. I want to see a few things. First and foremost, I want our libertarian messengers to be messaging clear, true, honest, bold libertarian positions. That includes things like ending government schools right away. <laughs> that is the libertarian position. That is the only libertarian position, minarchist or anarchist. I want to see a cultural change start to happen where we are actually defunding and dismantling and delegitimizing the state. 
I want to see less people using government schools either through policy or because more people are simply opting out. I want to see the current nervousness about not having enough people sign up to join the drug war on the police side to turn into an outright panic where people are simply refusing to join because they will not be part of it. I want to see us to be part of that cultural change. In short, I want statists to be opposing libertarians just as much as Democrats oppose Republicans. I want to make it clear that we are here to make big, huge, bold things, not just debate like college professors, but to do things that are gonna make some people happy. And yeah, some people are gonna oppose, them, oppose us. That's what real politics look, looks like. My goal by 2020 is that we are making big changes in government and making big changes in culture. And I think that we can make it happen. All right, thank you very much. We're going to move on to Mr. Merced. You have about 10 seconds to respond to this question. Okay, at the end of the day, it won't be me who decides whether I'm successful or not. It'll be the delegates in 2020 who decide I'm successful or not. Until then, I will be at LNC meetings focusing on pushing for ballot access support, technological support, and media support to make sure that candidates can do better and also working doing things like developing the ambassador program, working with caucuses in the caucus Congress to make sure that the channels of communication are open, there's party unity, and that translates into growing affiliates and growing numbers of candidates and growing wins. And if all that works out, then in 2020, delegates will give me a second term. All right, thank you very much. And now we're going to segue into the final part of our debate before we make closing statements. And we're going to make it a little bit interesting here. This is a bit unique. We're going to allow each of the participants here today to address one other participant with a question. And we're going to start with Mr. Merced. So Mr. Merced, you may ask one other participant um, a question individually. You have 30 seconds to ask the question and the person who you asked it to will have 60 seconds to respond. And in, in addition, um, we'll allow other candidates to jump in um, to as for, I mean, for a response after both the question and the answer have um, proceeded. All right, Mr. Merced, you have 30 seconds. Uh, this question is for Joe Hopman. If I remember correctly, I think you've served on the LNC in the past. So my question is, when you served on the LNC, what do you find to be the greatest challenge on serving on the LNC? And what would you do differently on the LNC now? And what advice would you give to everybody else? The biggest problem I had saw when I was on the LNC, at that time, the LNC had a bad tendency to micromanage to decide every small of the uh, office. Um, there was a point when the office director could not even sign a lease for a copier without it going before the full committee. Um, I've, I find that basically the, the dark side of this, they're in their hearts, they're micromanagers. Um, and so that was the biggest problem. I would say the biggest thing is to try to remain civil, to not take um, you got about 10 seconds. positions that are appear to be uh, personal attacks just because you disagree. And also don't shoot, try for the cheap win. Okay, don't try using um, parliamentary procedure to, wrap it up. to push something through that in reality you don't have support for. All righty. Uh, okay. Uh, would anybody else like to jump in and respond to either the question or the answer? I'd like to respond to the question. Sure, go ahead, Steve. Or Mr. Yeah, I think the LNC um, has a bad rap for not doing anything, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're not communicating what it is that they are doing. I've seen a lot of issues with this in the past year, most recently in Nebraska. The LNC had stepped in to help out, but nobody really knew about what it was that they were doing. I think we need to have some kind of a bold statement or bold way of presenting what it is that the LNC is doing and is accomplishing yeah. across the nation. Okay. All right. We're going to go ahead and move on to um, the next question, which is going to be asked by Mr. Vora. Mr. Vora, what is your question for one of the candidates here tonight? Uh, this is ch different from my original question. It's from Mr. Sheets. Uh, Mr. Sheets, if you were in a legislative position or a presidential position in which you could immediately, this very day, abolish all government schools, all charter schools, all vouchers, and all other forms of education funded by taxation, would you do it? Wouldn't it be wonderful if that was possible? 
my God, it would be so perfect if we had the perfect libertarian solution to replace it instead of having everybody out on the streets wondering how it is that we're going to educate our kids. Unfortunately, we don't live in that world. Our world where we're living in right now is a world that is run by government schools. It's like trying to move a 60 mile freight train that's running at 150 miles an hour. You can't stop it on a dime. You must slow it down first. Then when you finally stop it, you can reverse it. We need to have a legitimate solution in place first. And I would really love to work with a lot of people, yourself included, to try and find those solutions, try to make that free market solution a reality. And then we can make it compete <coughs> in the free market of ideas. With due respect, Machitz, was that a yes or a no? Brother, I think I answered it clearly. Nah, not to me. That wasn't a yes, oh, and it wasn't all right, a no. All right, all right. Okay. Um, we're going to enter into the next part of the debate uh, or this question where other candidates can jump in, respond out of the question. Okay. okay. Mr. Merced, you have 30 seconds. Okay. First, on, I want to say unequivocally that yes, if, that, if I were a legislator and that was a bill before me, I would vote yes for it. But I'd also vote for everything else along the spectrum, whether it's a, a small step towards more choice for people in the education of their lives and, and less taxes on their businesses, people to live more, have more control over their life, body, and property in their life. I will vote for the boldest move in that direction, but I'll vote for the lightest move in that direction. So the answer is yes, and it's yes to everything in between. Mr. Moderator? Yes, Mr. Pascal. I'd like to respond for a few seconds, please. Go ahead. You have 30 seconds. All right. I mean, this is a rabbit hole that we don't, we have to watch how we approach because it wasn't very long ago in our country where the company stores that the miners had, the railroaders had owned everything, decided where the kids got educated. If they got educated, it went by where you stood in the corporation, in the mine, if what benefits you got. We have to be very careful when we start abolishing things of what's going to take the place of that. Five because, seconds left. because if we get rid of one evil, we may have a, a greater evil replace it. Okay. I'd like to respond. Go ahead, Mr. Weeks. You have 30 seconds. Well, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on what Joe was just saying. Um, we, we can't fall into the trap of uh, you know replacing – you know, getting rid of one evil and replacing it with another. Um, going back to the company towns, you know, my great grandfather, he was in a company town and he was there as a kid in a mining town and he had to escape as if he was just, you know, he was a runaway slave. He had to escape the thing because the way the company towns worked, you know, you had, uh, you went into debt for him. It was automatically rigged where you didn't pay enough, you weren't paid enough of a wage in order to pay the debts that you had to buy the stuff from the company store. You know, so we have to be very careful that we don't end up with a trap like that again. Um, and that's why uh, we really need to watch our branding a lot, especially when trying to reach out to more people, you know, uh, worker rights or human rights. And that's something that we ought to champion um, as much as possible. All right. Does anyone else have any more responses before we move on to Mr. Question? No. All right. Mr. Sheets, um, you may ask a question. You have 30 seconds. Make sure you ask it to one specific uh, participant. This question is for Arvin. Arvin, um, and recently Larry Sharp left the LNC, Trent Soames left the LNC, and Patrick McKnight left the LNC. I just want your thoughts on that. I didn't want them to leave the LNC, but I did want them to either leave the military or stop promoting the military. And you're talking about three people who have actively and openly promoted military worship, whether it's Larry Sharp beginning his introduction with the word veteran, whether it's Trent Soames actively talking about how good it is to be in the Marines, literally doing recruitment for them. Um, Patrick McKnight has actually been a little bit lighter. You know, He was in the military, I believe, but he hasn't said that much about it. What I want to see right now is us to move into a culture where we are not pretending to worship things that should not be worshipped. We should not be worshipping people whose jobs are morally dubious. I'm talking about military and government school teachers whose effectiveness has been essentially non-existent. And so I'm sorry to see them go. I didn't want them to leave. But I don't think that we need to be beholden to worshipping that which absolutely should not be worshipped. All right, does anyone else have anything to add regarding this? Uh, yes, I do. 
All right. Um, you may go, Mr. Merced. You have yeah. 30 seconds. Um, when it was sad to see great people like right. Patrick, Trent, and Larry leave the LNC. And, you know, that that <laughs> that is a problem. And that's why I'm also going to be pursuing, I'm announcing right now, that I will be pursuing um, Larry's seat as the alternative for uh, Region 8 for the special election that will occur. So if you, were, if you are in Region 8, uh, reach out to your state chairs, reach out, show support. Show support if you support me in, in, in basically getting on the LNC as the Region 8 alternative to the seat that Larry vacated. Could I speak? Yep. Uh, yes, you may. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to see them leave. I think it was exactly the wrong thing to do. Whenever you're involved in a conflict and you leave the field, your opponent is the winner. So I would say that their actions were the exact opposite of what they should have done. I guarantee you, if you stay in this party, there are people who tell you they don't belong, that you don't belong. I have had many people from Rothbard on forward tell me that I don't belong. He used to call people like me envelope stuffers, okay, because I was interested in politics and not you ideology. You have five seconds left. I... In all honesty, I think they should have gotten grown a, a little bit thicker skins. Okay. Uh, I'd like to respond. Sure. Go ahead, Mr. Weeks. Uh, you know, the whole take my ball and go home thing is not uh, <laughs> its not really something to be admired. I just want, you know, even if there's disagreements um, that libertarians have with each other, we still need to stick together and work it out. And um, I would never be one if you know if elected as vice chair to to all of a sudden you know throw my hands up in the air if i don't get my way and take my ball and go home okay all right uh just for the record i want to make it clear trent soames uh did not resign regarding the situation trent soames resigned regarding um a con a conflicting interest in a separate job that he had taken up uh would any other candidate like to respond to this question okay Seeing as nobody would like to respond, we're going to move on to the next candidate asked question. Mr. Weeks, you have the opportunity to ask one of the other participants in this debate tonight any question regarding um, their run for vice chair. So go ahead and ask me. I have 30 seconds. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Sheets. Uh, you say that you'd want to uh, work together as long as we meet your definition of professional. How can you call for diverse messaging and then limit it to only your preferred approach? Wow. Um, well, what do you think is going to help grow the party? Obviously, you have you have a different idea of what professional message is and what professionalism is. <coughs> My personal feeling is, um, okay, we have an elected libertarian. We did it by working professionally, establishing a professional mem message, and that's how we move forward. That's what I would like to see happen across the United States with libertarianism. We can help each other in this. We don't have to be adversaries in this. And frankly, if you want to be an adversary, it's just the wrong attitude to have, man. So yeah, I mean, I'm gonna work with you as much as I can work with you, but if you don't wanna work with me, that's on you. All right. What do you I, think, I think the question was misunderstood. Oh, okay. Um, okay. You still have about 20 seconds left, Mr. Sheets, if you wanna continue saying anything. Well, what I, exactly? What are you, I'm saying, how, how can you call for diverse messaging and then limit it to only one, you know, not diverse approach? You can have a diverse messaging without having a uh, with, with having a unified professional approach, man. Um, you don't have to have it, it doesn't. I, I'm sorry. Your, your question really doesn't compute to me because um, we have a large number of, of ideas in the libertarian party right but we rest them in a professional manner okay uh what i think can only like to respond to the question or the answer okay seeing as somebody yeah, would like would to just, oh, just, just go ahead a Mr. couple of seconds okay i think part of our problem is we have very different ways of pushing the message. We have very different ideas of what a good outcome is. 
Okay, I'm not sure that everyone agrees with Mr. Sheets that electing a low-level libertarian, okay, on a fairly normal position is a good outcome. My pos idea is rather than us fighting about this, we should simply say, um, James should simply say, Mr. Sheets does not re represent my way of thinking. Okay, and Mr. Sheets should simply say, Mr. Weeks does not speak for me. And both go do your own thing. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to respond. All right, Mr. Vore, you may go. Um, if you look at the breakaway political movements, the ones that have been successful in the last you know, year, or you can go through most of history, you're going to see things that are exciting, incendiary, bold. I'm not, I don't agree with the actual content of the alt-right, but you can see that offensive messaging can make a movement grow. I don't agree with the policies <laughs> of Trump. But you can see that offensive messaging can make things go. The idea that if no one's disagreeing with you, you're winning is false. If no one's disagreeing with you, they're just not taking you seriously. They're not, you're not doing politics at that point. You're just kind of doing community activism. Real politics involves opposition. That is true of every political movement in human history that I know of in the last years, in the last decades, in the last centuries. All right. We're going to move on to our next uh, participant question, and we're going to ask Joe Hopman for, for your question. You may address one other participant, and you have 30 seconds to ask your question. Okay, James. Uh, I'm going to go back to a forum that I wasn't able to take part in, but I got to listen to you. Um, and that was, you made a comment that in Michigan, you knew more anarchists outside the party than you knew people who were actually members of the party in Michigan. Yes. My question to you is if you know all these anarchists, why aren't you running the Michigan party? I'm sorry. Could you, uh, you broke up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, if you know more people, anarchists outside the party who agree with you, why don't you run the Michigan party? Cause you said, oh. you know, more of them than there are <laughs> members of the Michigan party. That's a good question. And like my point of that whole statement was, is that they will literally have nothing to do with the LP. They would sooner have any, you know, they would not absolutely nothing to do with it. They refuse to come to meetings. It's been, I've gotten like a handful of people to be able to come to an LP meeting because they want nothing to do with it because they look at the LP like it's, it's a plague on libertarianism. They look at it like it's a cancerous growth that needs to be cut out because of the messaging, because we've drifted so far away from libertarianism that they want absolutely nothing to do with the party. They want nothing to do with it. They look at it just like the general public does, that we're just Republicans who smoke pot. That's what they look at it. I get made fun of by them for being active in the Libertarian Party. They like to call me a giant status and stuff like that just for being here and trying to make a difference within the LP. But I believe in the LP, and I'd like to make the changes that make the Libertarians that want nothing to do with the LP want something to do with the LP because there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, there's more of them out there than we realize. There's more of them out there than we have any idea. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Weeks. Um, would anyone else like to comment on this question? All right. Mr. Merced, you have 30 seconds. Okay. Um, basically, I seem just from the, the, the last couple questions and the overall vibe of just talking about sort of what the message should be. I don't like the Libertarian Party should be sort of a more wider net for the spectrum of libertarian messages. To me, if you really want a hyper niche message or targeted message, I think that's more the role of the caucus groups and candidates where you can have a message that targets a particular uh, target market. And I mean, that's the beauty of the Libertarian Party that you can encapsulate all these different views. <coughs> so I would rather see that sort of hyper targeted messaging occurring at the caucus level, candidate level in, in instead of saying hey this is how the liber this is how the national party how we should all be pushing at the at this level of aggressiveness with this level of moderation it, it, we should be open to all of it and then target it in those special groups so that way you have that uh, wider net with those compartments in the middle i'd like to be recognized all right mr vora you have 30 seconds to respond to the question there is certainly a diversity of ways that a message can be presented you know i speak differently on rt than i do on facebook obviously 
But within that, there are certain things that don't fit into either minarchism or anarchism. There's no space for the drug war in any kind of libertarianism. There's no space for government schools in any kind of libertarianism. And once we allow the message to actually violate our actual views, we're not talking about messaging anymore. Now we're just talking about lying. And I flatly do not believe that that kind of lying and pandering has any place in the party of principle. Okay, would any candidate like to, would like to go? We still have um, a, a little bit of time left for this question. Okay. Um, one second. Um, if I could, there is a diversity of messages. There is a diversity of ideas in the Libertarian Party, and it absolutely should be. I agree with Alex. It absolutely should be left up to the caucuses. But yet, we can focus on a professional message, a professional message that's clear, concise, and consistent consistent with our statement of principles, right? That's what we're all about. We all have this core statement of principles. The caucuses can shape that message, but my God, man, let's do it consistently. Let's do it professionally. Let's not act like a bunch of idiots when we're running out there. And and that way, maybe people will take it seconds. seriously. All right. Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator. Yes, Mr. Like you, you may speak 30 seconds. I, I mean... You know, we focus on a lot of negative things. It's negativity toward the party, toward a candidate, toward somebody in the party leadership. What if we focus that energy and get out in the community and do things, help Habitat for Humanity, wear a libertarian T-shirt while you're doing it, help feed the homeless, wear a libertarian T-shirt while you do it. Then guess what? The people in the public are going to say, Oh, they're not the guys that just bitch and whine all the time. They're actually out here helping. They care about their community. They care about their community and they care about their country. All right. That's good. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, and the last candidate who has not asked a question yet is Mr. Pascal, uh, the man who just spoke. You have 30 seconds to ask a question to any one of these candidates. I would like to ask the question, Arvin. Arvin. It's... Um, I know you're an anarchist, and I'm. I support that movement, and I'm not an anarchist. But I, I see a lot of anarchists from yeah. the city that don't know how to split firewood or go deer hunting or or just basic survival needs. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, if we ever get anarchy, it's going to be bad for a little bit. It may pick up at the end, but you're not going to Kroger and getting your groceries. How do you, how can you help get that message to other anarchists to be prepared for the worst should it come? I, I actually disagree with the premise. I, as far as I know, Kroger is not run by the state. None of the stores that I go to are run by the state. Amazon.com is not run by the state. I'm not great with fixing plumbing, but the plumbers I call, they are not run by the state. Almost every service that I actually use is not run by the state. In fact, if I wasn't being robbed to pay for the state's idiocy, I would have more money to hire people for things that I might not know how to do. Now, as a personal note, I, ha I do think it's interesting to learn about survivalism. I've been learning a lot about that kind of stuff, but I don't think it's necessary. I think anarchism will make it easier to live, not harder, because the private sector treats you better than the state does. Okay, Mr. Weeks, you may respond. You have 30 seconds. Right, I'd like to start off by saying shortly after graduating high school, I drove my pickup truck into the woods in northern Michigan and lived there for six months with just a pickup truck and a tent. That's all I brought in with me. And I survived for six months just in the woods. So as far as anarchists not having survival techniques and stuff like that down, not me. I got it. I'm good. But that's the thing, is that <coughs> anarchy doesn't mean we get rid of all the luxuries that we've come to enjoy. Most things that we do are not done by government. You know, we're only talking about getting rid of government, not talking about getting rid of, you know, Amazon.com and stuff like that. We're talking about the, the, the giant things that are terrible with our society, getting rid of those. The, the, the welfare state, the warfare state, the... Uh, you know, the drug, war, all this terrible stuff that we've, we have, that's what we're getting rid of. Wrap it up. <laughs> we're, you know, everything that's good stays, you know, all, all the stuff that we do together, all the private charity, mutual aid in an anarchist society, people would come together more. So 
All right. Um, we're going to wrap it up and we're going to bring it to our closing statements. So everyone is going to have one minute to make a closing statement um, about their candidacy, about the debate, about whatever you want. And we are going to start in reverse order. So we're going to start with Mr. Pascal. Or, yeah. All right. You have 60 seconds to make your closing statement. Well, I thank you guys for having me here. This has been very enjoyable. And I'm, I really like meeting all the candidates as well. I mean, I think we talked about a lot of different things here, and I think we can all agree on, even though our method, means and methods are a little different, I think we all have the same end goal to get rid of some of these, a lot of the government programs That's that terrible. are burdening the taxpayers right. every year, I mean, and the general public. We want the government out of our lives, our day-to-day -day lives. Where it's supposed to go is a big debate. How far down the rabbit hole we want to go is a big debate amongst a lot of people. But the main goal is we can't get rid of all government until we shrink it to its bare minimum to start. So, I mean, other than that, you know, I'm pretty approachable. If um, anybody ever wants to ask me anything, Five you know seconds. how to get a hold of me. All right. And oh, thank you very thank much, you. Mr. Pascal. Thank you for showing up. Um, we're going to move on next to Mr. Hotman for his final statement. You have 60 seconds. I've been in the party almost 40 years. And one of the problems we have is the word libertarian describes two different things. One is a philosophy. The other is a political movement. They are not the same. The times that I've, the entire time that I've been in the libertarian party, the libertarian party has been a coalition of anarchists, of minarchists, of people who focus on the nap, of gold bugs, of uh, lifestyles in search of a justification. Everybody came to it for a different reason. The thing that united us was that we wanted to move the country in a direction of more individual freedom and less government intervention. I believe not only in a big tent, but as our current president would say, a huge tent. <laughs> I believe anyone who is unsatisfied with the size of government and wants it smaller should be comfortable in the Libertarian Caucus. I probably will never join a Libertarian Party. I will never join the Audacious Caucus, but I applaud you for starting it. I applaud the Radical Caucus. I applaud the Pragmatic Caucus. All right, let's wrap it up. That they should be out re recruiting people who agree with them. The umbrella for all of us. All right, thank you very Thanks. much, Mr. Hotman. We're going to move on to Mr. Weeks. Mr. Weeks, you have 60 seconds for your final statement. Well, that. we definitely need to expand the tent of libertarianism to include more libertarians. We need to make more libertarians feel welcome by not pandering to non-libertarians anymore. I want to never hear the phrase, oh, you guys are just pot-smoking libertarians again. I want that phrase to be dead. I want that to go away. I'm sick of hearing it. I'm sure everyone else here is sick of hearing it too. Um, so we need to rally up libertarians as much as possible from all across the spectrum of libertarians all libertarians of all walks of life all philosophies of all ideas of what a libertarian society would look like in the end of the day you know we are so far away from that we are so far away from a libertarian society that to fight over what a libertarian society might look like in the future is ridiculous right now we need to stop that we need to work towards downsizing government in any way possible we need to stop with the petty squabbles and we need to realize that there's nothing unlibertarian about any liber any of these libertarian ideas that we have in the tent unless they're using the you know compulsion and force to impose that on others then they stop being a libertarian but until that point they're a libertarian and they're welcome in the libertarian party all right moving on to mr steve sheets you have uh, one minute to make your final remarks. In Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, we had minarchists and anarchists working together to get one of our candidates elected as an auditor in the township. We also removed the Republican 
presence that was running that particular that particular election cycle. Every single one of them lost. Why? Because we went door to door. We did the working. We were professional. We had a clear, concise, consistent message. That's what worked. And that's what I want to bring to the national. All right. Mr. Vilra, you have one minute to make your closing statement. Our goal as libertarians is to downsize, defund, dismantle, and most importantly, delegitimize the state. And we can spend our time trying to get pats on the head from statists, do some nice and friendly charity work, show that we can be inoffensive, show that we're harmless, and we can do that. And yeah, maybe we'll get some people say, hey, you guys aren't so bad. Or we can be bigger than that. We can recognize that big ideas don't fit inside of small paradigms. We can recognize that neither minarchism nor anarchism allows for government schools. It's a big change. It's a change worth fighting for. It's a change that's worthy of our movement. We need to stop focusing on what fits into other people's paradigms and ask ourselves, what is it that we are that is worth our dedicating our lives, our souls, our energy, and our passion to? It's not soda taxes. It's things like ending government schools. It's things like ending the war on drugs. It's leaving NATO and bringing the troops home so we are never again involved in somebody else's civil war. If you want a candidate that's going to boldly fight for those things, no matter what the other paradigm wants me to say, I am that candidate. All right. Finishing off here with Mr. Merced, you have one minute. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Uh, the name's Alex, and I hope you guys will check out Alex Merced for LNC.com to learn more about what I want to do as vice chair. And there's thousands of videos and podcasts for you to learn where I stand on all the issues. But I want to say that no matter how New Orleans goes down, the winner is the Libertarian Party because everyone here is part of the Libertarian Party. All of these are leaders who will be helping candidates and helping affiliates regardless of what happens in New Orleans. So yeah. get to know all of us, get to know us, reach out to us because we are all here to help. Um, and one last statement regarding charity. Charity is a great way, whether it's charity, enterprise, anything you can do in your life to be the example of the Libertarian solutions we wanna be is something that we should applaud and encourage. So I encourage you to go be out in your community and be the example. So lead by example so that way people are like oh i want to do what that person is doing and that's how we get ideas across all right first off i just want to thank all of the candidates for coming out tonight i want to thank all of the viewers for tuning in uh this went extremely well uh and if you want to check out more of my work and drew's work at 71republic.com the sponsor of this debate uh you can find us on facebook at 71republic.com uh, i mean at 70 uh, yeah or 71republic.com or facebook.com slash uh 71 Republic, twitter.com slash 71 Republic. We're at 71 Republic on Instagram. We have a Gab account. Uh, we have our own subreddit. You can check us out at all those different places. Uh, once again, my name is Matthew Geiger, and I'm here joined by Andrew Zirko. We just want to thank you guys all for coming out, candidates and viewers alike. Uh, that's all. Take care. Thanks for doing this, thank guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.